In September 2014, the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe found out that an oil pipeline was being planned to go under this river. And by land, they consider sacred. This is an audio recording of what the tribe told the pipeline company when they first met. Before you get started on the project, I want you to know and understand that um, we recognize our treaty boundaries. This is something that the tribe is not supporting. This is something that the tribe does not wish. The, the entire area that you're trying to uh, take the pipeline through crosses our treaty boundaries and where we existed uh, before anybody. And so we have significant sites and we know what they are. Our history and ceremonies are who we are. The proposed Dakota Access Pipeline would cross the Missouri directly underneath a village site. I actually struggled. Do we want to tell something that's so important and sacred to us, to a pipeline company? But it's important for you guys to know the history and our connection to this area. We know what belongs to us, and we know what we have to keep for our children and our grandchildren. Dakota means friend and ally. This is Dakota territory. This is treaty territory. This is where you agreed not to come. We're headed right now. We're headed to Yanwakanga Kapi Wakaba, river where the sacred stones are made. In English, they call that river the Cannibal River. And it's a very special place. It's a very sacred place amongst our people. In 2014, the tribe learned that the pipeline, called Dakota Access, would go half a mile north of here, Standing Rock's northern border. While in some ways the fight against the pipeline began then, in other ways, it began a long time ago. My jurisdiction ends right here at this river, but yet my ancestral homelands extend well beyond the boundaries of this reservation. The 1851 treaty boundary is actually north of us, about an hour's drive. The pipeline's route in North Dakota is primarily on what is now private land but it's also land that was promised to the Sioux Nation by treaty in 1851. Eventually, the U.S. government took the land and sold it. When they found out about the pipeline, the tribe told the company they were concerned the project would damage historic sites within their ancestral lands. All across this land, all across these traditional cultural landscapes are places that were marked by stone where warriors fell in defense of our country. We're a rich, beautiful, vibrant culture, you know, that are here because of the sacrifices of our ancestors. That wasn't their only concern. While Lakota people, when we look at that water, that water has a sacred spirit to it. The company, Energy Transfer Partners, told the tribe the pipeline would carry up to 570,000 barrels of oil a day from North Dakota's oil fields to Illinois, crossing the Missouri River just north of the tribe's water intake. Originally routed for just north of the capital Bismarck, the company decided to move the pipeline by the reservation. So what about our drinking water then? They'll say that the pipeline has the latest and greatest technology and the chance of it ever breaking is minimal, so you won't have anything to worry about. Well then take that greatest and latest technology and put it north of Bismarck then. Why use it on us? We shared with them in detail all the issues and concerns that we have now that we're raising, uh, they knew back then. Because the pipeline was set to cross the Missouri River, it would need permits from the federal government. In this case, the Army Corps of Engineers. The government is supposed to consult with tribes, even on projects that aren't on reservations. But Standing Rock says the Army Corps didn't listen to what they had to say. You could ask the Army Corps today, has the tribe opposed this project? And they would say yes. Did they give reason? They would say yes. What they deem consultation is correspondence. Uh, they counted the number of times, they called the number of emails, the number of um, 
meetings, there were, I would say, two times that we sat down with the Corps of Engineers and we, our members openly expressed our disagreement on this. So they look at all the laws and they make sure that everything gets checked off. It sounds like you're saying the Army Corps regards the consultation as a formality to be overcome rather than an, any real dialogue. Right, that's exactly. After the few visits the Army Corps made, where the tribe showed them historic sites that would be impacted, the agency didn't seem to register what they were told. The Corps of Engineers this year issued a determination that no historic property is affected. Standing Rock wasn't the only critic. Three federal agencies, the EPA, the Department of Interior, and the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, told the Army Corps they were concerned that they hadn't properly consulted with the tribe or considered the risks to the water and land. When it became clear that the Army Corps wasn't listening to them, the tribe realized they had to do something to make their voices heard. We've been fighting these injustices all of our lives. In April, they started a camp here just south of the pipeline on the land of LaDonna Brave Bull Allard. I can't allow a pipeline next to my son's grave. Her father and son are buried just on the hill here. Hello. We needed a presence. We started off with three people that first day, and then we kind of expanded to 15 people to 20 people from the middle of April until July. It was in July that the Army Corps approved the first major permit for Dakota Access. An easement to drill under the Missouri River was still pending. That's when the tribe took the Army Corps to federal court. Then I got the notice that Dakota Access was going to start working in 48 hours, so I pulled up my iPhone and did a small video asking people to come help. I will stand to protect the water and the land. I'm asking each of you to come stand with us at Sacred Stone Camp. Gradually, more and more tribes began to show up, and the camp started to grow as the pipeline started making its way towards the river. As opposition grew, things came to a head on September 3rd. All the women and children were along the line crying. They had just got through pepper spraying everybody. People were standing at the line, then started pushing as the dogs were coming. That day, protectors from the camp had tried to stop Dakota Access from bulldozing land, but were met by private security guards working for the company. And I remember standing there thinking, where am I? Is this America? It was only after this, and hundreds of tribes arrived at camp, that the federal government said they needed to consult with the tribe more before they could issue the easement to drill under the river. Every day that goes by without the pipe in the ground, uh, under the river uh, is a good day. But I'm also fearful because it seems like we're running out of options and running out of time. As people settled in for a longer fight, the camp was growing. With so many nations showing up to support Standing Rock, we wanted to know what fights other tribes were waging to protect their land and water. I went to Standing Rock two times because what the federal government and the corporations are doing to them happened to us and probably the majority of the tribes across the nation. For Brian Clattersby, the fight at Standing Rock is all too familiar. Bridge is turning. That means the train is coming. In the 1890s, just a few decades after the Swinomish were forced onto a reservation here in Washington state, Railroad tracks were put down on their land. The federal government, our trustee, didn't really consult with us and allowed the railroads to put a railroad line in across our reservation without our permission. And that was in the 1890s. The Swinomish fought the railroad company for decades, eventually coming to a settlement with the company that now owned the railroad, Burlington Northern, a century after the tracks were first laid down basically said that they could bring 25 cars across our reservation 
each day, one train a day, 25 cars, no more than that. And they agreed to that. So the, the agreement between you and the railroad allows for 25 cars. Yes. This is way, way more. Yes, this is four times the amount. In 2012, we got wind through the paper that Tesaro Refinery, one of the refineries on our historic tribal lands, right over here, was going to expand their rail service to allow Bach and crude oil to come on. As production of the rail's main cargo, oil, expanded in the fields of North Dakota, the company increased the cars, but without the tribe's permission. The Swinomish asked them to reduce the cars, but Burlington Northern said no, forcing the Swinomish to take them back to court. Part of the tribe's concern lies in the fact that oil train accidents have dramatically increased in recent years. And the tracks here go by not only their main economic source, but across the water. Did you grow up fishing? Yes. My first uh, experience was fishing in this Swinomish Channel with my three older brothers and my mom and my dad. So what do these waters mean to the Swinomish? What does fishing mean to the Swinomish? Life. It's always meant life. We had salmon and steelhead going through these waters 365 days out of the year. We reached out to Burlington Northern to find out why they had increased the cars without the tribe's permission. But they declined to speak with us, citing the ongoing lawsuit. But in court records, the company argues its obligations are to its shippers, that they need to get the oil from North Dakota to the refinery, a conversation that essentially ignores the tribe's concerns. In Brian's office, the tribe has records of where the fight originally began. Back in 1889, the railroad, of course, was making its way across America and just laying tracks unchecked. I mean, it was, once again, manifest destiny at its height. And so right here is no authority for a railroad to cross Swinomish Reservation. And we know how that turned out. It wasn't just water drawing people to Standing Rock. It was also land and identity. What Standing Rock is standing for is exactly what we're fighting against right here. Just like for the Swinomish, Standing Rock echoes out here in Nevada for the Western Shoshone. Where are we driving to now? We're going to follow this gravel road out, and we're going to go over to the Dosawi quarries. We're headed with Joe Holly his mother Kathleen and Aunt Carleen, to an area that's been used by tribes here for thousands of years and is still used today for prayers and ceremonies. This is the mine here. All of the land here, in addition to millions of acres across the western US, was guaranteed to the tribe in an 1863 treaty. But the government says the tribe lost their title to the land through, quote, gradual encroachment, something the Western Shoshone dispute to this day. Now the land is managed by the federal government through the Bureau of Land Management Agency, or BLM, who opened it up to gold mining decades ago. Before, it was Kathleen's husband, Joe's father, who fought the mine. For Joe, today the fight is about the way the government continues to permit activity associated with the mine, most recently, this power line. So you've been coming here with your mother for how long? She, all my life, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Since I was a little kid. Uh, so I'm 82 you know. now. So yeah, yeah. 82 today. Why would you bring him here when he was a boy? Oh, so they could know how things are, the way they were, the way it looks, used to look. It's changed. Everything changed now. The BLM allowed this road to be pushed through. Our shelters are right here. That's a shelter. There. That one, this one, that other rock point right below it is a shelter. The BLM approved the permit for the power line, despite the fact that it goes through areas eligible for the National Historic Register. 
including this doctoring trail the tribe uses for healing, dotted by ancient shelters. If you walked down to there and it was summertime, you would see all the workings, all the stone that was worked and left. All this has been authorized by BLM for the mine to do what they want. Joe says they asked the BLM to move the power line away from the trail, but the agency said no. So the tribe took the BLM to court, but by then it was too late. This is our history. This path that is now gone, we still pray here. How do you wrap your arms around that prayer now that there's something in the middle of it? It'd be like sitting in a pew in a church, trying to listen to the pastor talk with somebody blasting a stereo right in between. Just because that's a shelter there, there, and there, does that mean we can cut a road right down between them and it don't matter? No, because there's existence in between that that needs to be remembered. My kids need to know why. Why were they set up the way they're set up? BLM declined our request for an interview, citing the ongoing lawsuit. The case is still in court, but Joe hopes the tribe can at least protect what's left from further expansion of the mine. To have to watch and witness <clears throat> as all these things were being desecrated and destroyed. How do you stop that? It's like someone holding a gun to your child's head and you know he's gonna pull the trigger. How do you stop that? Do we give our life to stop that? Ultimately, a piece of us um, <clears throat> died with, with, with them cutting into our mother. How do we pass this? How do we tell our kids, you know, <clears throat> what? How do we show them? This is our ancestral land. I think so many of the native people have stood up and gone to Standing Rock for the simple fact that we all share the same fight within our own boundaries. It's fights like those of the Western Shoshone, the Swinomish, and countless others that were driving more supporters to Standing Rock, even in the face of mounting risks as the state security presence was increasing. I love you. I love you too, Erin. Please don't do anything crazy. Lauren and her sister Erin are members of the International Indigenous Youth Council. When we met, Lauren had been at camp for three months. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you. I love you. I'm not here on... And what's it like? You guys are camped out here, and just a few hundred yards away is uh, Dakota Access, and a lot of security, a lot of uh, police. Yeah. It's... I mean, I guess it... The anxiety never dies here. That's the only thing, you know, because at night, you still see all those lights lined up. As construction got closer to the river, confrontations with police protecting the pipeline grew more heated. Is it broken? It's fractured, my wrist. But I can move my fingers now again, so that's pretty cool. After two and a half, almost three weeks. Wow. It'll heal. Lauren told us that in late October, a policeman fractured her arm with a baton. That was around the time that another camp had been set up closer to the construction site. Oh, Scary there was you? another confrontation with police after that. What? And they actually re-broke it. The new camp, known as the North Camp or Treaty Camp, was set up on land set aside for the Sioux in the 1851 treaty. On October 27th, police moved in on it. You could see all the officers still surrounding all the people, and you could see that a big old group of people were just on their hands and knees already. 
They don't arrest you like they do on the streets, you know? Like, okay, put your hands behind your back. No, they go and they tackle you and they knee you and they punch you and they kick you and they beat you and they abuse you. And then they handcuff you. I had been up there protecting again and I was trying to prevent an armored vehicle from coming into the camp, so I stood in front of it. The cop was just like, you're under arrest. And he grabbed my wrist first thing and twisted it. The county sheriff's office claimed they have shown restraint in their policing. That day was just one of a number of times that violent confrontations broke out as everyone waited for the Army Corps decision. It's crazy that we had to like kind of relive that in this day and age. It's 2016, you know? Are you just... scared of going out again after being wounded? Um, part of me is because it does hurt still a lot every day, you know? But you just learn to move past that, you know? I can be sad here crying about it over here not doing anything, or I could be on the front lines helping the land. I'm here till it's over. Since the treaty camp eviction, the main highway has been blocked off. Is it frustrating that you can't access those sites? I don't know that frustrating is a strong enough word for that. There's an obligation under the law for federal agencies like the Army Corps uh, to look out for Indian tribes like the Standing Rock Sioux. It's one of the ways in which we've tried to, as a country, compensate for the terrible history and treatment uh, of, of uh, indigenous peoples in the past. In the tribe's legal case against the Army Corps, the government argued their jurisdiction was only for federal waters and land. But historic preservation law says the government needs to consider whether or not the project they're permitting could have impacts on historic sites even outside their jurisdiction. In this case, private land. They try to thread the needle. So if you represent an archaeological site, I represent an archaeological site, they're going to try to thread that needle and go straight through us without realizing we might be connected to each other. So this is where the pipeline is supposed that's to go? Pipeline route, that's 1806. And this these, is the area he surveyed. And these dots are sacred sites that he found? Yeah. In late August, the tribe was finally able to survey private land by the pipeline route, where they say they found sacred sites. So here's some photos. I guess for a layman, we don't know what we're looking at, but to uh, right. someone from Standing Rock. Well, that's why, I mean, that's why the law gives the tribe the right to make its own determinations. You know, to, to you and me, it might look like rocks in the field. Right. Uh, the, the particular pattern shows it to be something far more significant in a religious sense. On September 2nd, they submitted these details and locations to the court. The next day, this happened. They jumped 20 miles on September 3rd and destroyed just those sites identified. That was the same day private security guards used attack dogs on people trying to stop the bulldozers. Afterwards, an investigation was carried out by the State Historical Society. As a result of that investigation, we issued that memorandum saying that no human remains or burials were impacted by that. Well, was the tribe allowed to take part in that investigation to um, conduct a survey with you? Uh, uh, on that date, uh, uh, no, they did not. They were not there. They're saying that with their cultural knowledge, they're the ones who can identify these sites. These are sacred sites. It's religion. It's, it's hard to identify these things sometimes. And they feel that their input is not being valued at all. Um, those locations um, 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 were taken into consideration, I mean, based on our, our visit and... Uh, but Dakota we, Access didn't allow them to come with you. I mean, this is concerning. Yeah, yes, that, that, that could be viewed as a concern. There was eventually a follow-up visit, which the tribe was allowed to participate in, where they said that sites had been impacted, but the state disagreed, which allowed construction to continue. If you threaded an oil pipeline uh, through Arlington National Cemetery, and manage to sort of wind your way around the gravestones and say, look, we've taken care of the problem. I think most people would agree, no, that's not good enough. At very best, that's what happened here. Um, but I think it's a lot worse than that. The facts show that sites have been destroyed, have been disturbed. When they came through and desecrated those sacred places, 
It was a total disregard for who my ancestors were. But not only that, it was a total disregard to who we are today as a people. There seems to be differences between what their the, survey and yours. I would just say that maybe one issue where um, an archaeologist um, may not recognize the same set of uh, stones or other features on, on a landscape as, as cultural, uh, whereas uh, 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 a native person may uh, address uh, a different um, value to that. To know that even standing right here with you today, I can look out on that hill hillside and I see stone features. I see burial cairns. And because of how North Dakota Shippo is, is working with us, or the lack of, and how Dakota Access Pipeline is kind of bulldozing their way through this process, I don't know that I have that ability to protect what I'm looking at out there. And that kind of hurts, because again, once it's gone, it's gone forever. The state also agreed with the Army Corps in their initial review that said the pipeline wouldn't disturb historic sites. With support for the pipeline reaching to the top of North Dakota's government, we wanted to speak with the governor, Jack Dalrymple, about the project. His office never got back to us, so we've come to the capital to see if we can find him. Hi, my name is Sharif. I'm with the Fault Lines. I just have a quick question about Dakota Access. Uh, we're busy right now, like just saying goodbye to people. Just a very, just a very, very quick question. Why is the pipeline company? Before we could ask a question, state troopers pushed us back. We wanted to ask the governor why he so ardently supports the pipeline company and not the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, their sacred sites and water. But he clearly didn't want to respond to those questions. More than the governor, we wanted to speak with the Army Corps of Engineers, but they declined our request to speak with them about their review of the pipeline. But what would have happened if they had listened to the tribe from the beginning? Would the pipeline be at the water's edge, waiting? Would the tribe's sacred sites still be there? In December, as Standing Rock and everyone at camp began to prepare for the incoming North Dakota winter, they received surprising news. After months of waiting, of protest and violence, the U.S. Army announced they would be denying the easement for Dakota access, and that they would do a full environmental review and look for ways to reroute the pipeline. But the day after the announcement, it was clear that their victory could be short-lived. Dakota Access declined to be interviewed for this report, but in statements have made it clear that they don't intend on changing the pipeline's route and stand ready to drill. And with Donald Trump, a supporter of Dakota Access and former investor in the company poised to take office as president, the fight is anything but over. They don't know our land. We know our land. We know our history. America has to be accountable now. A realistic ask is for them to recognize that those lands were illegally taken from us and that those places are dear to us. And we want to have a say when they're crossing through our treaty lands. The day after the Army's announcement, as winter arrived in force, people at camp made it clear that despite all the uncertainties, they weren't going anywhere. If it doesn't go through, it means that we're being heard for the first time. And it's um, something that we've always asked. If it does go through, uh, again, it's another wrong done, another wrong committed on indigenous peoples. It's bigger than just Standing Rock. They see the wrongs happening to them. So the stance, it, it represents their fight too.